Welcome to our latest posting on the video blog of St. Nicholas Orthodox Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. This Sunday, we continue our study of that second creation story in the book of Genesis, found in Genesis 2, by looking more closely at the place that God put us. We read, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground... The Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Verses 10 to 14, then, talk about a river that flows out of the garden and about these rivers that are connected to it. And as you look at it, you almost get the sense that, that we're getting a set of coordinates as to the location of the garden based on these rivers. A lot of people have talked over the, the history about where exactly is the garden. And there's been a lot of theories about that. But the basic point that these verses are trying to make is the fact that the garden was a real place on this earth. It had an actual location in this world. That's really important to understand. The garden was not heaven. When we were cast out of the garden, we were not cast out of heaven. The garden was a geographical place, a solid concrete place in this world. We are made for this world. And that connects to something we said last week when we said that human beings are not holy, spiritual, beautiful souls trapped inside profane bodies. That body and soul are both holy. And in a general sense, both the spiritual and the physical realms are both holy. God made both of them. And so all these details about where Eden was is to get across this idea. Eden was a concrete place on this planet. We learn in Genesis 2, of course, that there are two trees in the Garden of Eden. One is the tree of life, and the other is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, with this second tree, there comes a warning. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. Some people ask whether or not God was really being fair, putting the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. It's almost like he was setting Adam and Eve up for failure. Here are these two people who don't know good and evil, and the only way that they will know good and evil is by taking part in a tree that they're forbidden from taking part in, and therefore they get outside of God's good graces. So, so is this fair at all? Is this a reasonable thing for God to do? That's based on a very narrow understanding of God. God, this, this angry being that, that's just waiting for people to make mistakes so that he can hurl down a thunderbolt and, 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 and get us for, for going wrong. Even the Old Testament clearly shows that God is loving and caring and, and that, he, that he wants nothing more than, than the best that he can absolutely offer us. He made us not to, not to destroy us, but to give us life and perfection. Look at the Psalms. Psalm 102 or 103 in the Hebrew numbering, God forgives all our iniquity and heals all our diseases. He redeems our life from destruction and crowns us with steadfast love and mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Well, that doesn't sound like the kind of God who would play a nasty trick on the creatures that he made in his own image. Now, a number of the fathers say that the prohibition to not take the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not even a permanent prohibition. It wasn't that they could never take that fruit, but it was that at the point of creation that Adam and Eve were not yet ready for the fruit. That after they'd grown more, intellectually and spiritually, when they could handle the knowledge of good and evil, then they could take part in that fruit. Knowledge is a good thing. But without proper wisdom, th that knowledge can be very dangerous. And so this is how the, some of the fathers frame this, is that it wasn't, you may never take part in this tree, but it just wasn't time for you yet. Back to the question, though. Was God setting Adam and Eve up by putting the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Well, you're going to have to come on Sunday because that's when we're going to talk about that. For now, though, let's just think of it this way. Any parent of a teenager has at some point in time said to their kids, 
It's my house. I get to make the rules. Well, it was God's garden. It's God's universe. He gets to make the rules. And in the garden, we only had one rule. Stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was it. That's all. We also had a warning, and this is an important point that we have to get straight here. When God gives Adam the warning, don't touch the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he says, if you do, you will die. He does not say, if you do, I will kill you. He says, if you do, you will die. What he's doing is he's laying out for Adam the consequence of not following God's word here. It's not the punishment of, I'm going to get angry and I'm going to get you for this. But this is a dangerous thing if you do it. And if you do it, you're going to get hurt. Every responsible parent knows that one of the things they have to do is keep their children away from danger. God, in giving Adam and Eve this commandment, is trying to keep them away from the danger of the knowledge of good and evil before they are mature enough spiritually and intellectually to handle it. Now, the other tree in the garden, of course, is the tree of life. This is the place where humanity would take part in the life-giving grace of God. In other words, this tree is a sacramental presence in the middle of the garden. In the very first video in this series, when we talked about how we read the Old Testament, we said that we look for typology in the Old Testament. And typology are these markers, these pointers from the Old Testament that lead us into the teachings in the New Testament. The entire Old Testament is about Christ and it's about his church. And so it is here. The tree of life is the sacramental presence of Christ in the garden. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. We define baptism as being grafted onto Christ, who is the tree of life. One of the hymns that we sing before the Nativity Feast says, Make ready, O Bethlehem, for the tree of life will soon blossom forth from the virgin. So that makes a clear connection between Jesus and the tree of life. Christ is the tree. In this world, the fruit of that tree is the Eucharist. We partake of the Eucharist to receive life. Now let's just take a second to think about this. Eden has a river, and it has the fruit of the tree of life. It has water, and it has this sacred food. So again, these are types that point to the New Testament. To what? To baptism, the water, and to the Eucharist, the sacred food. Also this Sunday, we are going to learn why the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a critical part of the garden because this tree allowed us to do something very important, to exercise a very critical part of the image of God in us. And through that, we were able to enter into a right relationship with God that allowed us then to draw near to the tree of life and to partake of its fruit. And we'll see how that is connected to taking part in the Holy Eucharist. But that's for Sunday. For now and for always, to God be all glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, both now and forever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. We'll see you in church.